Hello, my culminating friends. Today, I'm going to be speaking to John Hayward. John is one of the go-to guys on Twitter. I am always, every time I look at John's uh, Twitter feed, I ask myself, why have I not been paying attention for the last couple of days? There's always something that I missed. Um, the, the thing about following John Hayward on Twitter, John is primarily employed as, as a Breitbart contributor. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about his interesting career, but um, the tricky thing about John is that it's almost impossible to con to accurately convey his Twitter handle by uh, or orally because it's Doc underscore zero, a real nerdy loser name. Um, and, <laughs> and for quite some time, uh, and John has been on Twitter only a few months less than I have been, September 2009. Um, John, how long were you uh, anonymous on Twitter? I was uh, I was basically anonymous as a writer for about a year, a little over a year. When I first became a blogger, I started as a commenter at Hot Air, the blog Hot Air. I was just writing comments on posts, and the other readers voted to give me a spot, to give me a perch at Hot Air, and they asked me if I would write a few columns a week for them on an amateur basis. I started doing that, and once I revealed my real name after about a year of writing that way, I got an offer to go pro from human events almost immediately and change careers and been doing that ever since. But the Twitter handle is kind of a holdover from those days. I probably would have used my name if I wasn't anonymous, but back then everybody was. Nobody knew what was going to happen if your name became known, if your identity became public. We all had usernames and I picked one I liked. You can tell I'm on Twitter for a long time because it's short. <laughs> if, you're, if your Twitter handle is four that's characters true. long, you're you're an old timer. See, that's a good point because I was going to say, have, have, you, have you played with whether John Hayward or some variation of it is available? But it, it's a lot longer and clunkier than doc underscore zero, even though that's got all the syllables in it when you say them out loud. Yeah, it's a bridge to the past, too. It kind of reminds me of the blogging days, which were a lot of fun. I regret losing that to some degree. I'm still trying to blog on Twitter. That's pretty much what I use it for. Well, you're 100% right. And that's why I don't blog nearly as much as I used to, because what in many cases used to qualify as a blog post and like I don't know about you, but for me, the model was always Instapundit. That was mm -hmm. that was the classic, that was the paradigm. That's how you blog. That's how it's done. And so many of the besides little phrases that I have, uh, what would we do without experts and stuff like that, that you know, all my all my moves are either Glenn Reynolds moves or derived from Glenn Reynolds moves. But I realized what used to qualify some on a you know on a on a on a busy day as a blog post, which might have been been a sentence with a link in it, is now a Twitter post, and what mm -hmm. and and if everyone is in the main place, tweeting tweeting, then it's a lot for me to ask to get them to click through to actually their confusion. Uh, of course, I used to also blog on Dean's World. I don't know if you remember that. Yes, I remember Dean's World. Blog. And I'm actually a little bit in touch with Dean, who has kind of come, you know, he he's he's had uh, he's had some living in this world. Uh, let me tell you, he's, he's had some interesting experiences. Um, and you know, Hot Air, when uh, Michelle was starting Hot Air, I got a call from her and Ala Pundit, and they thought. Because Ala Pundit was, Michelle was looking for sponsors. And I was a very active blog ads user. That's when I first had my, my own law firm, which I don't now, I'm, everyone knows I'm partners with Arnie Dillon, but there was a time when I had my own law firm. And I was using blog ads to promote it, which was incredibly revolutionary, um, as was blog ads. So I suppose he thought, I would be in for, you know, Michelle was obviously brainstorming with, with him. And this was the old a la pundit <laughs> before whatever it was that happened to him it happened to him. Um, he said, well, Ron Coleman advertises on blog ads. Maybe you give him a call. And I, when they called me, I thought she was calling me to like be a contributor. 
because I'm such a great blogger. <laughs> and she just wanted money. <laughs> and <laughs> I am a very good blogger, but I didn't have money for her. <laughs> Not for a hot air. Um, in any event, John, it, it is great to, to, to see you face to face. And um, I see, it, it, I'm actually quite intrigued by how you are described on the Breitbart page, which I suppose I ought to share again. Oh, this is how you describe yourself. You're a conservative because there's so much about the American tradition that is worth conserving. Amazing that anyone is even allowed to say that anymore. I wrote that a while ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you, but do you, but, but is it, is it less true now or is oh, it? No, absolutely. I completely believe it, but you're right. I mean, that is sort of a controversial statement. That was middle of the roadism 10 years ago. And today, I guess it would be called right wing extremism to say something like that. And I must say, and this is, I mean, people should definitely feel free. Just like, you know, when, when my wife and I, ha I go to a lot of, um, dinner oh, like award dinners it's a very big thing in the orthodox community like there's hardly anything that we can do but eating is something that we can do and we do a lot of it um and she's offended by how people talk and eat while someone is speaking but really you can't be because people have to eat people have to eat at least but so people can read while i'm talking that's fine there's a lot that's fascinating here to me one of them is your expertise all of which is amply reflected in your incredibly incisive tw tweeting. Um, and the reason you're obviously so good is because you, you have an associate in the arts from Edison Community College. In other words, you have not been cursed with the pundit's curse of having a, a, attended one or more Ivy League schools you're just like a Rush Limbaugh. You're like merely a, a, a guy with a really good head on his shoulders who did, wasn't warped by, you know, the experience of, of an overly elite education. I'm very impressed. I, I had to earn a living. I had to get out there. It was a fine little community college. It was a great education. I had wonderful teachers. And I can tell you, I still remember every class I took during that sojourn in college. I felt like every one of them had something to say. Even at the time, I might have thought, a public speaking class, what am I ever going to do with that? That's crazy. Now I do it all the time. You know, that's that's sort of and the way you, life yeah. goes. Do you do it all the time? Do you do a lot of speeches? Yes, actually, in my previous career as well, I, I gave seminars and gave a lot of presentations when I was working in the computer industry industry. And once I started being a pundit, I've also been called on to do that sort of thing in person and virtually. But at the time in college, it was snicker, snicker, easy credit, we're going to take a class in public speaking. And of course, half the class had a heart attack at the thought of getting up in front of an audience. And you don't know until you try. But I'm one of those people that doesn't have a heart attack when you talk to an audience. But did you before you took the course? I didn't know. I, I would never have known if I hadn't done that. But the, I, the idea comfort. didn't terrify you necessarily. I don't think so. I think I was a little nervous as a kid. I think a lot of us are. You don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to go up there and you're going to say something or stutter or drop the ball and you're going to look bad and people are going to laugh at you. We all have that Brady Bunch fear, you know, that it's not going to go well when you're in front of an audience. And until you've really tried I think it, you most just don't know. I think most normal people do. I mean, I, I do think egomaniacs such as myself, um, I, I, it's, it never occurs to me. It never occurs <laughs> to me. But But I will say that what what I'm celebrating here to a large extent is you really legitimately present on Twitter as someone who knows about the things that Breitbart says you know about. And you are not you don't have the credentials. You don't you're not an mm -hmm. expert. And what have we learned about experts in the <laughs> year in the in the in the second decade? If we hadn't already learned it of the 21st century. I think everybody who wants to be an expert should be constantly questioning consensus, which they don't. You shouldn't be in a bubble. Too many of them are. And too many of them have no lived experience, to use a common phrase, outside of what they're an expert in. I had to work in the private sector for many years. I was an employee of a small business, several of them. I worked for small businesses during a long career in computers. That was a very useful education. It taught me how businesses run. It taught me what those people were up against, how to make a payroll, the, the kind of challenges that they face, what their, their lives are 
like. I got feedback directly from them. And you cannot look at today's economy on the dawn of the Biden recession and not see that this is an economy planned, executed, imposed on us by people who have never done any of that. They have no idea what it is to meet a payroll. They have no idea what it is to pay a bill. They've all come out of this bubble. They've all slithered out of ivory towers. And they're working out their theories about transforming us without even thinking about what it means to people who in the Biden administration has even stopped to think about what forcing everybody to use electric cars is going to do to small business people or rising gas prices, how difficult it makes entire business models to even exist when you crank up the cost of energy and force them to use that kind of technology. Nope, it never occurred to them because they've never lived in that world. They've simply never thought of it. But I mean, you know, FDR never lived in that world. And yet, notwithstanding the fact that I'm sure you and I have no trouble agreeing that he is that the consensus on FDR is woefully, woefully overly generous. But I don't think anyone has any question that FDR had the common touch, that he understood the problems of people who were not to the manner born as he had been. Um, what is astonishing, or maybe not astonishing at all, if you are familiar with this generation as you, as we as you and I are, they don't have the ability to understand people who are not like them mm -hmm. i mean they don't have as you say the lived experience you don't have to have if you know if you're if you're an intelligent person you don't have to have been a farmer to understand that farmers are having a problem under situations x y and z and we should you know we should care about them the caring is is entirely performative i mean at this point can anyone is there really a serious argument to the contrary that the you know the patina of caring and being the compassionate people that the left takes on that the democratic party takes on is entirely a cynical exercise in political manipulation <laughs> Look at how ruthless they've been recently under Biden. They don't care what it's doing to your life. They're going to force you to give up your carbon footprint. They're going to force you to make do with less. They're going to force you to drive an electric car. They want you to stop complaining about your gas bills, your grocery bills, shut up about the recession. I mean, these people were brutal. They don't care about ordinary people. You're clay in their hands. They live in a world of theory. And I think a, a good point you made there about FDR, about the previous generations, I think it was maybe a little harder 100 years ago to live in an entirely imaginary virtual insulated world where you had no contact whatsoever with the external realities well, at least then, in the united at least in the united states in the united states right i think <laughs> i think so in the class the class system in in the in the in the uh, in, in britain which is the the best comparison to the us canada being a very nice state but i never really think of it uh but you know there's the closest culture to ours in many respects but there definitely were people who never, and yet you had someone like Winston Churchill, whose entire life was an elite, notwithstanding the fact that the guy was a prisoner of war, a literal legit war hero. He did, he did it all and he put his own neck at risk and all those things. No one ever questioned whether he felt and truly cared about the people at the other end of the social scale. Yeah, that's right. Because I think in this day and age, we have an entire class of managerial people, elite people, uh, academics who have been insulated for life from all contact with the regular world. The people making our policies are not in any way affected by them. They guarantee that they won't be. And you can run down the list. I mean, everything on the, the Democrat agenda, the left's agenda, the big government agenda, name every single one of those positions. And you will immediately see that the people authoring those policies are in no way affected by them. Gun control, they have armed security. They don't care about you you giving up your guns, gun control, you being vulnerable, maybe getting raped. They don't care. They've got armed security. Screw you. Well, they're they're going to have fossil fuels. They're going to have limitless energy. They're going to have food. They don't care about you. They're protected. And we've reached an inflection point as um, just a great term that my wife used last night, so it's fresh in my head. I should be using it in every podcast. We reach an inflection point, I think, in the last five to 10 years where no, the last five years or so, they don't care that we don't know that, that we know that they mm -hmm. don't care. Yeah, I, I tried to say it slowly and I still screwed it up. They don't care. In fact, there's an argument, and it's a legitimate one, that not only do they not care, 
they're pleased that we know that that they're pleased that we know that they know that we know because that's part of subjugating us is our yes. understanding that this is how it is you have nothing to say about it and 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 i mean this goes i mean john what's going on with the schools what's going on <laughs> Well, the elites are insulated there, too. Their kids are off at Tony Private Academies. That's been true for decades now. Your kids are consigned to failing public schools, but they're fine. Their kids are taken care of, so they don't care that you have to suffer. And look at what they do when you confront them with that. I think somebody did actually get through to Barack Obama back when he was in the White House, and he was blocking school choice, but his kids are off to Sidwell Friends. And somebody actually asked him, how can you justify this? And he said something like, you have to understand that as a father, I want to best what's best for my children. You, you can sure understand that at a human level and i guess that worked on the the coastal elites they all said wow you know what a, what a great statesman and every normal person in america is like you know up yours you got to be kidding me what about my kids what about my prerogatives as a father what about my fate you want me to be sympathetic with you because you're taking advantage of the elite circles you live in to give your kids the best while you can sign mine to hell and i'm supposed to understand you and say wow what a great dad you are i guess i can see why you're screwing the rest of us over i mean that phony pretense of compassion has grown thinner and thinner Thinner, especially over the last 15, 20 years. It really has. But I mean, I, you know, again, you're right, the 15 or 20 years, but as I think about it, the intensity of the, um, you know, especially since the Biden administration, because now, I mean, look, we, we, during the Trump administration, we began to see the hints that people in government who worked for the president of the United States were going to openly frustrate I openly frustrate as well as secretly frustrate his policies and his instructions and the law and arguably he and certainly we would have nothing to say about it. mm -hmm. it's there's a real crisis of legitimacy <laughs> wouldn't you agree well, and, and you touched on that earlier when you talked about how the elites want you subjugated. One of the ways you subjugate people is by making it clear there's a crisis of legitimacy and it doesn't matter. Like you can think they're illegitimate and doubt them and disbelieve in them and distrust them all you want, but they have the power. What are you going to do about it? And they tend to decide things and enforce things in a way that change your life. They spend huge amounts of money very quickly, you know, with, with blinding speed, cutting the government by a billion is unthinkable, but spending a trillion is Tuesday. And they, they do it so fast that they create a reality in which you can't resist. It doesn't matter if you don't agree with it. What are you going to do? The money's all spent. Economists talk about the fallacy of sunk costs, spending good money after bad, you know, the way most people would say it. You just keep spending on a failed project because you refuse to give up. That's a fallacy to economists, and it's a fallacy to you and I probably, but that's how the government works. That's not a fallacy to them. That's their core operating system. Sunk costs is how this entire enterprise keeps running. We well, can't reform Obamacare. We already poured all this money into it. You can't give up on it now. But, right, and 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 it's interesting because I, I spoke to Nan Hayworth, um, I don't remember whether it was yesterday or the day before, the days all do kind of look the same in this office, um, but, one of the, you know, I was talking to her about Obamacare and about health care and what an intractable, seemingly intractable wreck it is because you have this distortion of the, of the price system and just even, you know, if you wanted to just go absolutely cold turkey and just, you, you really, it would be mayhem, mayhem for years and it would cost lives. I'm not saying that the alternative it doesn't also cost lives, but it would be a it would be a train wreck. But if there's one thing that you probably could pull the plug on right now, and it would take less than a year for the cards to reshuffle successfully, I would say it's public education. Mm -hmm. Yes, if that would be a great start. Just pulled the plug and said, "Hey, look, by the way, if you're an experienced teacher, you'll have no trouble getting a, a job in a private school. You'll probably even do better, by the way." If yeah. you're a good, experienced teacher, 
and expectations would be made of you. Standards would be enforced much more so than in the public school system. One of the reasons public schools are so degenerate now is that the people enforcing the rules, the referees, are also the players in the game. They're never going to call themselves out. Bad teachers are protected. We've all heard the horror stories. If you've seen uh, the movie Waiting for Superman from some years ago, it was about people desperately trying to escape failing public schools by hoping a lottery would let give them a chance to go to a private school. They would sob in helpless frustration if they didn't win the lottery because there was no way to save their kid from the fate that was awaiting them. We would never, ever tolerate a privatized industry delivering those results, not for a microsecond. We'd have people marched off to jail by now if we had private education schools that were working for everybody, if we had a true privatized system. There would be congressional hearings till doomsday. But when it's the public school bureaucracy, when it's unionized teachers in the Department of Education, suck it up, cupcake. Put up with your substandard education. Give us more money. Stop complaining. All we really need is more money. They're, they're like the worst company that ever worked for you. And when you complain about their rotten service, they say, give us more money and it'll get better. Yeah, I was about to, I was actually thinking when you were talking about, about the um, sunk costs fallacy, that there's a related fallacy, which is real X hasn't been tried yet. Mm -hmm. So real spending enough money on the schools hasn't been tried yet. And no matter how much you, and the, and like like any statement of faith, it, it can't be falsified mm -hmm. right. because, well, no, we all know that 35,000 per student is not nearly enough. Is 50,000 going to be enough? We have to try it. We won't know if we don't try. But we certainly know that, that if it's not working now, the answer can't possibly be to go to zero. Mm -hmm. Right. And even if you chart those costs against the rest of the world, we do have a basis of comparison. We can compare our test scores to both historical American test scores and also in other parts of the world and per capita student spending. And it's clear to see that the United States is just one massive rocket launch of increased spending and declining performance, stretching back for decades. It's never stopped getting worse, not for a minute. And now after the pandemic, we have this new freaking horror that we all learned about where it turns out the schools have been turned into indoctrination centers for these radical ideologies, for transsexual fascism, for critical race theory, we never would have known because the public education system had no interest in telling teachers or parents. And they told the kids, don't tell your parents. First thing you hear when you get into a critical race theory or transsexual indoctrination session, don't tell your parents. They're none of their business. This is between you and me, five-year-old kid. And they go to work on your kid with a hammer and tongs. We never would have known about any of this except for the pandemic lockdowns, remote learning, and parents literally looking over Junior's shoulder and That's losing their minds when they saw what was on the computer screen that's, that's exactly the only reason right. this is happening it's amazing and uh, my, my wife wrote a couple of articles about that and, and her own and you know in her her own bit of punditry um which she's quite good at john you seem to you know you have a um an important presence at breitbart and you know like i said i i think you're in an absolutely invaluable follow on twitter have you ever felt have you, have you ever been pressured to retract anything by no. twitter no because no. you because i think no. you you play things pretty pretty clean and yep, you don't I, you, I... you don't use a lot of rhetoric Mm -hmm. I, I try to avoid that. I, it's a tweet. You've got a tweet. And even if you're doing a blog post on Twitter, you've got 10 tweets, 15 tweets, still very focused. You don't have a lot of time to ramble or make digressions. And if you throw in things that don't belong in that stream of consciousness, you're going to detract from your argument. It's going to hurt it. So I think that keeps it focused. And so far, I've never done anything that they felt compelled to come after me with. Now, I've heard they're starting to crack down on people who say we're in a recession. So I might be going toe to toe with them pretty soon because we are and I'm not going to stop saying. It. But so far, they've never tried to censor me that I'm aware of. If they've done it stealthily, I don't know about it. And, do, and have you ever had? Have you ever self-censored in order to avoid that possibility? No, no, I've I've never really started started to write something and then said no, I'm not going to do this because I could get in trouble. I don't want to play that game. I don't think any of us should. That is tyrannical. And if anybody doesn't understand that, you really need to consider what we're saying here. That you would be afraid to express your true thoughts, your honest feelings. With all due respect, you don't use profanity. You know, there's obvious things we don't throw in there that that are repulsive. But if you're sitting down to make a clear, concise statement and you stop and say, I better not say this because I might get in trouble with the sense answers. We're not in America anymore. We're in communist China. And we're, we're way too far into that environment where people there censor themselves. I will not engage in self-censorship. So you haven't felt the need to do it and you haven't had it done to you. 
Um, so do you think, uh, you know, the people who are hooting and hollering, including in many of my clients and uh, former clients and some mostly former because I couldn't help them, uh, is it them or is it Twitter and Google and YouTube? Well, I think there's an, a major X factor that could be considered, and that's whether some people have been targeted. Sometimes I think the automatic algorithms of the all-seeing eye of Sauron over there at Twitter headquarters will miss things, but then activists will target people and institutions and bring it to their attention. And it's really not difficult to do. Ten years ago, one of the big controversies on social media was called spam flagging. I don't think anybody really uses that term anymore, but it was organized groups of leftists that would flag a conservative as a spam spammer, even though they, they weren't. And they realize that if like a thousand people do this in the span of a certain amount of time, the system will automatically suppress their account. So they were shutting down conservative writers and stuff by using this tactic. And eventually changes were made that was prevented, but it tested the ground for the kind of censorship we see today. And I'm sure maybe in the case of some of your clients or people that have been censored, it might be because somebody or a group of somebody's decided to call it to Twitter or Facebook's attention, rather than trusting the algorithms were going to find you automatically i think that's true uh, or or if if it's not necessarily activists who are bringing it to, to the attention of the censors it is the fact that someone already is a high profile individual and has and has been internally identified as a a person of concern mm -hmm. you know? yes now have you always do you consider yourself a libertarian or a little bit more of a cultural conservative? Uh, William you know, F. Buckley, uh, Pat, uh, Pat, you know, what's what, how do we, how do we a, cut button hole you? I know that both people will say John, a John Hayward conservative, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, in, in, in a few years, but <laughs> that would be nice to have my own movement. But, you know, I probably would have said reflexively before I became a professional pundit, I would have said more libertarian than anything else, because having experienced the tender, loving caress of big government, I just wanted to be free of it. And I was more and more impressed in my job of what individual people could do if they were left alone, of how clever and resourceful people were. I became more and more impressed by that distributed intelligence. And I thought if we leave people alone, if we respect the constitution and let them have their inalienable rights, they'll come up with amazing things that central planners could never see. So I, I believed in small L libertarianism for that reason. But as time has gone by, and especially as I've written professionally, more and more, I think conservative is the right term. And I don't think you can afford the, to afford the culture wars. You can't ignore them. You can't be forced out of them. You can't let the other side be on perpetual offense while you just retreat and give ground and give ground. Because at the end of the day, all of those libertarian freedoms might not mean anything if you're intimidated out of using them and that's how the culture war is fought oh, and and then of course obviously there's the convergence of the state and the corporate and the world you know the, and the, the global corporations mm -hmm. you know one of the problems with libertarians i think at this point is that they really can't grapple with that unless they make adjustments in what they define as in other words, if they have to grapple with the fact that coercion isn't only a something that comes from the state. It, it, mm -hmm. it actually can happen at the hands of, of, of you know, of, of business, which, of course, we all these were things we heard from the left in the 60s and 70s and mm -hmm. 80s. But now that they're at the controls, they're mm -hmm. cool with it. It's 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 really something, isn't it? What wasn't just about every science fiction movie of the 70s and 80s about a dark future in which evil corporations ran the government and worked hand in hand with it, and it was always this dystopian horror show where, where corporations and politics had fused and become one and the same, and then all of a sudden that is what happened, and corporations and politics are now fused today and are one and the same, but because they're of the left, it's like no problem. Forget we said anything about evil mega corporations; they're actually super wonderful and awesome. And I think one of the things that we didn't count on when we thought about those scenarios was that there would be so much money in the system that a very large cadre of people who matter, uh, CEOs, in other words, when you think of Big Brother, it's there's Big Brother and then everyone works for him and they're sort of, you know, they're sort of like they're Molotov types. Okay. So mm -hmm. they're living, they're living okay, 
you know, and they get their, you know, they get their Soviet limousine. But there's only one real guy who has this sort of ph phenomenal power. And what we didn't really consider was oligarchy. And we live in a state of oligarchy. And there are how many hundreds or thousands of billionaires in the United States right now who get literally get richer as others, as the majority get poorer and who influence policy in a manner that it literally puts more billions into their pockets or more hundreds of millions or many, many millions. And they control all the levers, you know, the, the social media platforms and the corporations and, you know, publicly owned corporation you realize is, is, is basically run by people who have like a warlord captured, mm -hmm. captured that fort for their self enrichment and for the development of a harem and all the things that you would expect a despot to do with the fort that he has captured or she. Mm -hmm. And so there, so you can't just say, you know, we got to get rid of big brother. Everyone is, Everyone who's in charge is big brother. And yet here we are. We are allowed still to have this conversation and people are still allowed to listen to it. Are you hopeful? Does this does this fact make you hopeful? Is there anything else going on that I should I should know should know about make you hopeful? I, I am hopeful. I, I think people are waking up to a lot of this stuff. I think they're seeing the problems and the fallacies in it. The recessionary economy is hitting people right where they live. It's waking them up. For the first time in my lifetime, I think a lot of ordinary people are beginning to understand that unlimited government spending is a bad thing and will kill us. You know, that we can't just keep inventing money out of thin air forever and throwing a trillion here and a trillion there, and it's never going to catch up with us. It is catching up with us. And it's good that people get that. I want them to think in terms of philosophy. Why? Not only why is this bad from a fiscal standpoint, but in terms of morality, in terms of American life, why is it bad to have all this government power and this fusion of corporatism that you mentioned, whatever you want to call it, corporatism, fascism. I mean, technically, fascism is that fusion of government and corporate power with corporations in, in the driver's seat. That is its core operating system. That's how all the fascist horrors of the 20th century began. And the way that you make it work, the way you make people swallow it is by winning the culture war. It was that very culture war dimension that the libertarians didn't want to engage with over the past 20, 30 years that turned out to be the key to building that corporatist system. You can't really get people to sit down while a rapacious corporation you know, destroys everything in its path and sucks up all the money. But if you tell people that rapacious corporation is selling electric cars, and that's good for the earth. And if you don't oppose them, well, the whole world is going to broil in global warming. How dare you question the science? Well, now you can have all the corporate fascism you want, and nobody will dare object because they've been told it's morally, culturally superior to have that fusion of government and corporate power instead of just caricatures of greedy zillionaires, you know, villains from old movies in the 80s and 70s. Today's corporate raiders and fascists are throwing green energy stuff around. They're wearing green costumes and telling you that they just care about the earth. And how can you possibly not care about about the earth what's wrong with you they care about the earth and they care about minorities even more than the minorities care about minorities and that's why any minority who doesn't care about minorities the way they care about minorities is the opposite of minority but when you talk about this idea that libertarians may, made a mistake of absenting themselves from the culture wars that leaves a vacuum what do they fill the vacuum with? Because the left has its mythology of leftist utopia. Maybe, maybe it's a Marxist utopia. I don't think it's particularly well thought out. Right now, they're mostly experiencing utopia because they have all the things and they and they, and they print themselves money and they award themselves money. And But what does a libertarian, a man or a woman of good faith who wants to see the common wheel benefit and grow and who is not a person necessarily of faith however and so i mean easy answer if you're a christian if you're a jew maybe if you're a muslim i don't know enough about islam but if you're a monotheist in the traditional american cultural sense you know what goes into that vacuum it's the values of of these creeds but we now live in a time when that's a very, not a very, but it's, it's rare. 
Mm-hmm. It's so what what does the culture do? What's the culture that goes into that vacuum? I think it starts with attacking, and I, I had a suggestion on Twitter for this the other day. This should be part of the Republican platform. Go after the way that the left and the Democratic Party thinks the problem with everything is you, not them, not their failed programs, not collapsing government, not that they were wrong about everything with the coronavirus. You, you're the problem. You, Mr. America, whoever you are, wherever you are sitting out there living your life, you're the problem. And every single thing they want to do will make you smaller, poorer, weaker, everything without exception. Every item on their agenda begins with the assumption that you as a law abiding, well-meaning citizen are inherently wrong and evil and a problem that big government has to solve without exception and without limits. Now you combine that with how obviously failed the big state is right now, the failure of experts, the loss of faith in expert consensus and the media very justified because we've seen how wrong they are, how corrupt and politicized they are. The public is ripe right now to be told that you don't need these inept Democrats taking more of your life over and trying to build their utopia. What you really need is more opportunity for you, your neighbors, your family, your friends, your businesses to flourish, to find these new solutions, not just financially, not just in the economy, but even in an issue like abortion. The, the Roe versus Wade overturn was a tremendous flourishing of freedom. And I don't think people are accepting the left's counter narrative that it's somehow tyrannical because that's obviously ridiculous. Now we're going to have a discussion in 50 states over what to do about abortion, when to allow it, when to restrict it, what restrictions there should be. And for the first time in generations, all of us are part of that discussion and it will never end. Because it's a state issue now, a state could change its laws. After the next election, they could loosen up restrictions on abortion, or they could tighten restriction on abortion. It will never be over. But we've already had judges decide that they have not, maybe they're not being done, being heard from. Where was it? Was it Georgia? Yeah, I believe that's right. It was Georgia. Judge in Georgia who said, well, obviously, uh, being uh, being anti uh, or abor- uh, laws that that outlaw or restrict abortion are theological in nature and that is a first amendment government well, in- separation of church in- and state endorsement of religion lemon test wall of baloney i mean the guy hasn't obviously read a freedom of religion case from the supreme court for at least 10 years these people don't give up, do they? Mm-hmm. No, but absent that kind of nonsense, I mean, you get past that kind of stonewalling, make it a, a nationwide issue for people. And what they're realizing is that they live now in a world of greater freedom and responsibility to decide what the laws concerning abortion are going to be. And all of us have something to say. It was always absolute nonsense to say that half the human race has nothing to say about abortion because men should just shut up. They're a part of this. They're there at the conception. They're involved in this. They need to feel moral responsibility and engage into intellectually with questions about when abortion should be allowed. We know most people in the country are more or less okay with early term abortions. It's something they're generally willing to swallow, but they had no idea how many late term abortions are being conducted, the reasons why, the the horror stories, the money, the profiteering. They had no idea that any of this was going on until now. Now, suddenly it's an issue for everyone. And you can follow that template with many other issues and say that if you are a free and responsible citizen, you should have an opinion on these things. You do have something to say, and you have a responsibility to think about it, not just say, eh, it's not my problem, and walk away. Not when lives are at stake, not when the future is at stake. But it does at the end of the day, right? Those things, column by column, what the issues are, people have to make decisions in their lives about not only deciding to care, but to guide them as to what that caring should indicate to them. And I just wonder whether they have, they, we as a country, maybe me and you as well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be elitist about this at all. Do we have the capacity to do that anymore? Certainly as a society, when there is such a, such a, a lack of clarity about what the source of values is. 
Mm -hmm. I, I think we do. And I think we do for much the same reason as the distributed intelligence of free people is so vastly superior to central planners in the economy, as it is with dollars and cents in industry. So it is with life, free people talking to each other, arguing with each other, reasoning with each other, comparing notes, comparing their values, testing things in the different places that they live. I think they will make better solutions than some group of rogue jurists ever would. I think it, it was madness for the Supreme court in the 70s to just wave a magic wand and say abortion is settled forever. It clearly isn't. And no matter what ultimate consensus we do arrive at as a civilization, however long it takes us to get there, I think the end product is going to be better than any central planner a moral issue could arrive at, just as central planners of economic issues deliver one hideous failure after another and then just fight to prevent anybody from noticing their failures. That's true of moral and social issues as well. We do better when we're allowed to discuss these things among ourselves and maybe find solutions the central planners, the academics, the people in the bubble would never think of. So that requires a minimal amount of gatekeeping mm -hmm. to those places where things are discussed. Mm -hmm. Right. It requires uh, a degree of education. I mean, you're obviously a, a reader. You got a whole bunch of books behind you. It doesn't look like a shower curtain. And I'm sure it's only a, uh, a percentage of, of what's in the house and what's been in the house. W where do you live? I, I live in Florida. The, I have to give you the street address. I'm, I'm in Florida. I'm in DeSantis country. Good for you. Good for you. Say hi to my mom. <laughs> uh, it's... um. It's a challenging time, but I, you know, I do think that people who can, without running afoul of the rules that our betters have set for us, and most of which, if they were fairly and uh, uh, consistently applied, we would probably agree are reasonable rules. Not oh, m most of which, not all of which. I mean, I, 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 you know, this idea that an unnamed expert at Twitter is going to decide whether ron or john or anyone is guilty of spreading misinformation on health or the elections is preposterous mm -hmm. that goes to your distributed intelligence again so would you consider yourself a free speech absolutist? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty close to absolute on that. I think there are reasonable things about speech we all are aware of, like using profanity in inappropriate venues. I mean, these are matters of politeness. But when it comes to expressing ideas, absolutely. If we lose free speech, we lose everything else. Once you can't talk about something, that means you can't think about it. And if you can't think about it, what are you going to do? What, what do your freedoms really mean in practice if everything the state and the ruling orthodoxy dislikes has been rendered unthinkable? and unsayable. That, that is free speech is ground we cannot afford to give up on. And you know, no matter how many books you have on the bookshelf behind you, the machine I'm talking to you on right now can let me read 10,000 times as many immediately. The question is, will I do it? Will we do it? And I would submit one of the reasons the internet has not really flourished as an exchange of information to the degree we would like. I mean, there's a lot of pornography and whatever, but the reason that the internet hasn't really unlocked our true potential as people of learning is because we were not taught to think that way. We weren't taught to use it that way way. We weren't taught to question. We were taught to accept. There's generations growing up right now that have been told you have to accept the consensus of people who are better than you. And who are you to question them? Who are you to research or doubt them? This crusade against disinformation is about preventing people from asking questions. But there's so much information out there. Yeah, some of it's not going to be accurate. But there's so much you could learn right now that when I was going to college in the 80s, I had to go to the library to get it. And it took hours. And maybe the book wasn't in. And now you can click your mouse and have it in seconds. We need to train ourselves as a civilization to start using that. Fantastic. John, fantastic talking to you. You are a font of common sense. Have you written a book ever? Are you going to write a book? Are you working on a book? Yep, I am trying to work on a couple of them right now, actually. But I have a collection of essays called Dr. Zero Year One that's out there on uh, Amazon. And also I like to write horror stories. Every every Halloween, I write a horror story and really? I've been collecting them into little anthologies and putting them on, on Amazon. You can find my first one. It's called Persistent Dread. Persistent Dread. Yep. I mean, isn't that pretty much just real life right now? <laughs> I like to think of it as escape from real life. 
uh, what's, it, it, and it, it's a horror story. That's not, not science fiction. It, it's an anthology of short horror stories. I write one every year at Halloween. I send it around to my friends and I figured that every time I have enough to do a book, I'll collect them and publish them online. Well, the, the, the quick change that I tried to do was to find the, uh, the anthology, which uh, is a, already uh, 10 years old. So obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have to, I guess I, I, that must be one of the two books. Yeah, I, I do we'll need another that. Another nonfiction book is coming. I do need to finish it. Some number after one, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Dr. You know, Dr. There's, Zero. Yeah. There's so much writing to do. There really is. There really is. And the one thing about Twitter, about microblogging, as they used to call it, is that it does tend to suck away your energy to write, to do the long... <laughs> you know, the long form stuff, which, but when, I, but when you do do the long form stuff, Twitter liposuctions away the intellectual fat. And when you sit down to write that book or that long form article, I think you'll find it tighter and more focused. If you're used to blogging on Twitter. I think that we're all better writers. Those of us who actually try to dis to make cogent arguments on Twitter, even if you do a thread, and as you say, the, the, how some people actually publish hundred tweet threads they're, they're, they're kidding themselves but even if you do a 10 tweet a five tweet thread you realize that every tweet has to stand on its own at some level and that's an incredibly good um you know exercise for a writer it really is it really is it's like stringing together pearls into a necklace instead of just throwing everything on a page and hoping somebody sees an article in there coils okay john again thank you have a fantastic florida day I hope we get to talk again soon. I hope so too. It's great and to I talk thank, with you. My, thank you very much for joining us. Take care. See ya.